Hey everybody, welcome to God's Blessing Farm here in Nyota, Tennessee. My name is Rico Silvera. Uh, we operate God's Blessing Farm, my wife and I, Angelia. It's a 38 acre farm between Chattanooga and Knoxville. We raise a number of animals here. We raise donkeys for both protection and milk. We raise uh, Icelandic sheep. We have some horses. Uh, we raise our own line of livestock guardian dogs, Muscovy ducks, Chinese geese. But we're here to talk about today is this special animal. We raise Maishan pigs. And uh, hopefully today, all the folks who join us will learn a lot about this interesting and unique breed. I'd like to introduce everybody to Pink Lady. Pink Lady is from the University of Illinois Department of Animal Sciences. She is uh, quite the rock star here. She's a four-year-old Maishan sow that we were able to obtain uh, as in the final dispersal of the Illinois herd. Uh, we were quite blessed. Uh, in the last 17 years, Illinois had not released any of their pigs to anyone, and we just happened to catch it at the right moment. As I said, Pink Lady's four years old. She's about a 400-pound pig, and she is a perfect representation of the Maishan breed. The Maishan breed comes originally from China. Uh, it was raised, it, it comes from an area in China that has been domesticating pigs for almost 5,000 years. It's quite possibly the oldest heritage breed available in North America. Uh, Maishans are known for their docile nature. They're known for their hyperproductivity. Maishans can have litters of typically 14 to 16 piglets. Pink Lady here last spring had a litter of 20. While they were in the research facilities, the American record is 28. And recently, while speaking to another uh, swine farmer in China, he told me that in 1982, a Maishan pig actually followed a litter of 42 piglets, 40 alive. As I said, Maishans come from an area of China where they've been domesticating pigs for 5,000 years. Maishans in China are considered a national treasure, much like the silkworm. I've read studies that the Maishan has 2,000 years of genetic separation between them and typical European breeds. And you've got to understand that most of the breeds in Europe uh, were brought over here. And so when we talk about a heritage breed in the United States, we're talking usually about a 200 to 250 year old breed. Where with the Maishan, we're talking about thousands of years in development. The Maishan comes from a region in China known as the Taihu region. Uh, that's because there's a large lake in that area called Taihu Lake. Uh, there's a series of pigs that come from that, that area that are known as Taihu pigs. Maishan is one. There's another smaller breed that looks very similar. It's called Fenjing. At one time in China, there were three distinct genetic groupings of Maishans. There was small Maishan, middle Maishan, and large Maishan. In the late 70s and early 80s, the large Maishan went extinct. In 1989, after 10 years of negotiation with China, the USDA, in cooperation with the University of Illinois and Iowa State University, negotiated the import of 99 Maishan pigs, uh, approximately 33 males, 66 females. And these pigs were divided equally, both in number and genetically, between those three research facilities. And what I mean by that is, if there were three pigs from one litter, one went to Illinois, one went to Iowa State, one went to USDA. The USDA kept these pigs at the USDA Meat Animal Research Center in Clay, Nebraska. The University of Illinois constructed a special research facility of over $1 million, and Iowa State took them to their farm in Ames, Iowa. The purpose of the importation of the pigs was that at the time, the U.S. pork producers were in crisis. Pork prices were down. Pork as a meat was thought of as being not healthy because of the fat content, because this was the time when they were telling us that margarine was better than butter. And further, U.S. domestic breeds in the 80s were not highly prolific. They would have litters of six, eight, nine. Um, there was crush rates where the mothers would lay on their pigs. And so you would have a four or 500 pound pig that was producing three to five piglets every six months. From an efficiency standpoint, this was terrible. 
Nations were brought into the country because they were hyper prolific. That the USDA postulated, and it turned out to be true, it would take 15 to 20 years of selective breeding to get American domestic litter sizes up. Now here was this pig in China that was routinely having 15, 16, 18, 20 piglets, and not only that, they were great moms. They had a much higher, what they call farrowing to weaning ratio. In other words, the babies were born, and the mothers were such good mothers that they were getting up to age where they could be weaned off their moms at a higher percentage. And the Maishan turned out to be everything that they said it was. Plus, it's this incredibly docile animal, and it's unique. But there was an issue. The Maishan is a lard carcass pig. It has lots of fat. In the studies with the Maishan pig, and they took them and crossed them to domestic breeds, with as little as 25% Maishan in the cross, they were getting much larger litters, they were getting better moms. But they were also getting more fat. This was all occurring right about the time that the American pork industry launched the, the new white meat campaign that while these tests were going on and experiments with the Maishans at the three different facilities, the USDA was changing their pork grading system about every three to five months. And each new highest grade pork had less and less fat. And while you would get more piglets from a Maishan cross, you would also get more fat. That was a problem because the efficiency that you gained in the amount of piglets that you produce, you lost because the processors would pay less because it wasn't grading out as the highest pork. So here we had a quandary. We had an ama amazing amount of money spent to bring these pigs over. They've been set up in three different facilities and under the agreement with the Chinese, these pigs could not be released into the general population. These were to be strictly research pigs. Well, research facilities do what they do. They continue to research the pig because there was still the mystery of what made these pigs so prolific. And because they were genetically unique, as I said, they had almost 2,000 years of genetic separation, they were used as a control group in comparisons to other breeds of pigs. So for 25 years, these pigs remained in isolation, both from the general population of farmers and from each other. They remain in genetic isolation in three distinct herds because, talking to one of the early researchers, there was a level of competition between the three research groups. And they didn't share information, they didn't share stock. So we had these three genetically isolated populations. In 2014, a, st a study was published, uh, was done by Harvey Blackburn, who works for the USDA, at the genetic repository in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, it was given to me by Gary Rohrer, who's also a co-author of it. He works at the USDA Meat Animal Research Facility. The purpose of the study was there was a proposal for a treaty in the UN that countries would sign up and agree to exchange unique genetics from each country, small populations of unique genetics to uh, each country. And the, the postulate is, what they wanted to know is can you actually preserve the genetics of a breed with such a small population. They looked at the original importation DNA that went to, uh, that came into the country, and they looked at the pigs that were still at Iowa State and at the USDA. At this time, even the researchers at USDA weren't aware that Illinois still had a, had a uh, herd. And what they found was that the pigs had undergone something known as genetic drift. What genetic drift is, is when you take an isolated population of pigs, they actually change genetically and begin to drift apart. Uh, the DNA pairs that would normally be the same are now different. Um, and the study showed that, it was called the Blackburn study, the study showed that the USDA pigs and the Iowa State pigs had not only drifted away from each other, they had drifted away from the original importation sample. What this meant was that we actually now have three distinct bloodlines of Maishans in the United States. Um, this was first recognized by the American Maishan Breeders Association, which is the only registry for these pigs. And 
That is what we refer to today as the three bloodlines. The USDA bloodline, the Illinois bloodline, and the Iowa State bloodline. And Pink Lady here is a beautiful, beautiful example of the uh, Illinois bloodline. Well, we've moved to another area of the farm. In this area of the farm, we raise up uh, some of the pigs we've bred here and evaluate them to see if they go into our uh, breeding program. Uh, the girls you see here are all between 10 months in age, 19 months, 16 and 17 months old, um, all raised here on the farm, all pedigreed with the American Maishan Breeders Association. The very things that at one time made Maishans undesirable for commercial production of pork, because as the commercial business began to move towards confinement, pasture-type pigs like the Maishan, lard-type pigs like the Maishan became less and less popular. We almost lost entire breeds because of the rush for that dry white meat pork. But today on the modern homestead, as we start to reevaluate um, how we look at fat in meats, especially pastured fat, uh, fat in animals that are raised properly. Um, the Maishan is becoming a more and more popular breed for the small landholder. The reason being the very unique traits that make it a Maishan. One, they're very docile. Here on the farm, we have over three miles of fencing. We have no electric. To keep these pigs in, we don't need electric chargers, insulators, hot wires. Uh, we keep them in, in with woven wire field fence in cases where we might have a boar next to a uh, sow that we don't want them to breed. We'll reinforce that with hog panels. And then we use hog panels with smaller squares to keep our piglets in. So the docile nature of the pig makes it a really nice pig to have on a homestead. And they're great pasture citizens. They live with our livestock guardian dogs. Our chickens move in and out of the pasture. Our ducks move in and out of the pasture. We actually had a uh, hen set up with her chicks in one of the farrowing areas with a sow and her piglets with no incident. They're great pasture citizens. They also have a much lower impact on the land. They get to about 350, 400 pounds. Pink Lady, the pig we just saw, that's as big as a Maishan gets, as opposed to having a breeder that grows to five, six, seven hundred pounds. Maishans tend not to root. Um, no pig doesn't root at all. Pigs will root a wallow. If they're not fed properly, they'll root looking for food. But from an environmental impact, Maishans have one of the lowest environmental impacts on the land you can possibly have. Actually, the biggest impact they have is the weight of their feet. If you have areas, that right now we're going through the winter here in Tennessee, although it looks like shirt sleeve weather, we've gotten a lot of water, we have some areas that don't drain well, you'll get some damage from their feet, but typically what happens is that next spring the grass comes back even stronger. Uh, so they're a great pig. The other thing about them is that prolificacy. Having that many piglets. Most heritage breeds of pigs, the most popular breeds today on homesteads, have typically very small litters, four, five, six. So your efficiency as far as producing piglets, either for a genetics business model or a meat model, is much lower because you need one sow for every five piglets. With a Maishan, if you're going to uh, wean on average 12 to 13 pigs, on girl, 12 to 13 pigs, you're going to have a much more efficient producer of pork. Um, Smallholder farms face different challenges than large farms. And smallholder farms need to look at their breeds of livestock that they bring on like tools in a toolbox. All breeds of swine are good for somebody. What you need to determine as a small farmer is what you're looking for in your breed of swine. If you're looking for a breed that's going to be docile, does not require a tremendous amount of infrastructure, if you're looking for a breed that's going to have large litters so you can have fewer breeders to maintain 12 months of the year, uh, you can see by the growth that while they don't grow at a, quote, commercial speed where you get uh, 300 pound butcher weights, live weights by 10 months, they do grow much faster than a lot of the more popular heritage breeds. Um, 
our little girl there in the back, I don't know if you can see her in camera, uh, with our dog next to her, that's Ling Tang. She's only 10 months old, and she is at 300 pounds. Um, 300 pounds being typically the most popular butcher weight for a hog where you get the best yield. Um, so you've got a pig that grows at an acceptable rate, is docile, easy on the land, um, and you're helping preserve something that's unique and rare. Our journey with Maishan pigs started in 2013. Uh, at that time, my wife Angelia brought me a link to a web page talking about these amazing Chinese pigs that had large litters, were super docile, had delicious tasting meat, uh, were extremely rare, and I was fascinated. Um, at the time, we were raising, uh, we've been raising heritage hogs since we started the farm in 2010. I was raising American guinea hogs. I'd raised Cooney Cooney. I'd raised uh, Gloucester Old Spots. And with the smaller homestead hogs, the guineas and the coonies, you always face this glass ceiling, I call it. Small litters, um, slow growth, 18 to 24 month growth rates. Uh, the big thing was the litters to try to produce any pork at all. We needed lots of pigs. Um, it just really wasn't very efficient. They're great, all great breeds, and, and everyone has a different model for their farm, and we'll talk about that later. But as I started going through this investigation, it went from kind of scavenger hunt to detective story, and now at the end, I've traveled over 4,900 personal driving miles to put our herd together. Uh, I've talked to researchers from the original importation. I've been to two of the three uh, research facilities involved in the original importation. And I've even established contact with some of the leading swine geneticists in China at uh, Huazong Agricultural University. And what's come of it is, as amazing as this pig is, it is critically endangered worldwide. Um, Today, the Maishan pig in China is in serious decline. In China, pork is the number one meat consumed. And China, with their growing population, their growing economy, is faced with the same pressures that the United States was faced in 1980. They need greater efficiency in their pork production. And quite honestly, they've adopted our methods. They use confinement pork. Um, they're producing... Uh, pork in, in high-rises rather than pastures. And the Maishan doesn't, doesn't adapt well to that. But at the same time, the Maishan is a national treasure in China, and China is uh, overseeing the fact that they do not want to lose these genetics. However, today in China, Maishan are only raised on four government farms. Um, one government farm is totally dedicated to the small Maishan breed, uh, which is a it looks similar, but it's significantly smaller. The other three farms are dedicated to the middle Maishan breed, and it was the middle Maishan breed that was imported in 1989. All the pigs that were brought in were middle Maishan size. Um, the problem is that these three farms only have 1,200 pigs for the, all of China, and only 10% of those pigs are boars. So that means within China, there are only 1,200 documented pure Maishan pigs. There are some gilts out in the general population, but they're typically crossed because in China, only the government can own a Maishan boar and only the government can state where a Maishan boar goes. Of those 1,200 pigs in those, in those factory or in those government farms, only 120 are boars. So today, in China, you have less than uh, 1,200 documented pure Maishans, only 120 are boars. Here in the United States, the American Maishan Breeders Association is going through a national herd survey right now, and all indications are there are less than 150 documented pure pigs in the United States. So if you take the entire worldwide population, you're probably talking about less than 2,000 pigs. And these pigs are important, their genetics are important. So if you're looking to add a pig to your homestead, you may want to consider the Maishan not only because it's a great fit, but because it's an important conservation project. Um, when I was negotiating with the um, 
USDA Meat Animal Research Center in Clay, Nebraska to get the last of their pigs. Those were great people. I will always be thankful to them. Uh, the pigs were scheduled to be slaughtered. Uh, in 2008, Iowa State began dispersing their herd and uh, they were done by 2010, but the USDA had had these pigs since 1989. They had never sold them to anyone. They had put them through generations of experiments, but they had come to the end of a trail where they didn't feel that the expense was justified by the potential return in research. And I just happened to call when they had de decided that they were going to slaughter these pigs. And I, I got to talk to the, the facility director and you know, I pointed out that Small farmers, homesteaders, are the best reservoir for genetics for unpopular breeds. We wouldn't have Mulefoot, Red Wattle, American Guinea Hog um, today if it hadn't been for small farmers. And if they could see their way clear to let us have these pigs, um, then we would do our best to make sure these genetics were saved. And to their credit, they said yes, we were able to get five distinct boars and two distinct sows from USDA. We combined that with our two sows from Illinois, and we had two sows and a boar from a farm that had gotten their pigs directly from Iowa State. Together, this makes the most genetically diverse herd of Maishans outside of the United States. And we're hoping in this video today that not that you will feel like you need to come forward and help preserve these pigs, but that preserving these pigs fits your farm. And that by, if, by bringing an animal onto your farm to preserve it, it also serves you as the breeder. What we talked about uh, a little bit earlier was uh, your farm model. And do Maishan pigs, there are plenty of reasons to raise Maishan pigs, but the best reason is that the characteristics of a Maishan pig fit your farm model. We're over here with Panda. Panda is our newest mom on the property. She just had a litter of 12 piglets. Um, that's about average. She had 14 her last litter. Uh, they're in there munching away. Uh, Panda is a University of Illinois uh, sow that we got from Illinois. She's Pink Lady's sister. She's about 375 pounds, just a little bit smaller than Pink Lady, but has all the same attributes that the Illinois bloodline shows. Uh, she's a great mom. Um, but that's a lot of pigs, and so your farm model, uh, when I always ask people, I see that there are three different farm models for the small land homesteader, and we have 38 acres, I consider us a small holder. Um, are you raising pigs for personal use? Um, you're not looking to sell meat, you're not looking to sell breeding stock. Um, are you in a meat model? And that is, are you raising pigs so that you can produce pork uh, to sell to individuals, restaurants, CSA, uh, however your distribution model is? Or are you raising pigs to produce quality breeding stock for other breeders? Here at God's Blessing Farm, and that's a genetics model, here at God's Blessing Farm, we are definitely and always have been a genetics farm. Um, we've been blessed with putting together this herd and we've worked diligently to try to identify breeders all over the United States. Uh, we've shipped Maishan, registered, documented Maishan breeder pairs to Washington State, Maine, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Georgia, South Carolina, Ohio, Illinois. Um, so our, our model is that we produce breeder pairs. It's why we have so many boars. The genetic diversity that we have allows us to help breeders, responsible breeders, put together breeding herds that um, can go on long after God's Blessing Farm is gone. Uh, if you're in a meat model, you've got to have customers, and typically a meat model is, it's a very local model. You sell to the same people in your general area, and typically a genetics model is you sell to people all over the country, or at least in a region. Um, the guys get a little nervous when I'm talking, but you can see how docile even Maishan moms are that I'm sitting in the farrowing area with her and her piglets and she's essentially asleep. I've even fed her, but she won't come out to talk to us. Um, but 
Once you identify what your model is, then you can talk about how you need to profile your herd. If you're in a meat model, you need one boar. And depending on how much meat you can sell is how many uh, sows you put, put into your herd. Remember, Maishan's produced lots of piglets. Uh, if you're in a personal model, you probably should have a pretty big family or relatives because even with just one litter a year raising up 10 or 12 piglets, that's, that's a lot of pork. Um, but in a meat model, you now have an efficiency where in the same amount of space, in the same amount of land, with a smaller breeder pair size-wise, with a lower number of breeding sows, you can produce lots more piglets. When people are looking at a, at a meat model, my suggestion is that you start out with a breeder pair and buy two feeder pigs, castrated males, and raise them up so that you've butchered them, you've tasted the meat, you've gotten samples to give to your customers. Long before you start breeding uh, pigs to sell out on the marketplace, what I say is build demand before you build supply. If you're profiling for a genetics model, this is very early in the conservation effort uh, for Maishan pigs. Uh, Maishans are not widely available, and when people come to me, all the places that we've sold uh, breeding stock, it's almost exclusively breeder pairs. People don't buy individual pigs from me. Um, in the three years we've been selling pigs, uh, taking deposits on pigs, we've sold two individual pigs. Hey, Panda. Um, to produce a genetically sound breeder pair long term, you're going to need two boars and two sows. And that's, that's an investment in facilities, that's an investment in stock. Um, registered Maishan stock is not inexpensive. Um, so knowing and, and I know a lot of times people tell me, oh, we want to do both. They're two completely different businesses. And yes, you probably will do both at one time, but one will be the focus. So my advice is, before you, if you decide that these incredibly unique pigs are something you want to do, understand what you want them to accomplish, how you want to accomplish it, and how you need to profile your herd. Well, we're going to take a break uh, from visiting the pigs and talk about one of the most important end products of Maishan pig, the Maishan pork. Maishan pork is treasured throughout the Orient for its flavor, its tender taste, and its fine grain fat. Um, Maishan pork is not the new white meat. It is not pork for people who are fat averse. It is not a vehicle for sauce. It's a standalone meat with an incredibly delicious flavor. What I'm showing you here is about a three pound ham roast from a Maishan pig. You'll notice it has a larger fat cap than a typical commercial hog. However, it's not one of those super large fat caps. What's really important is you see all this micro marbling throughout this deep red pork. Now there's a trick to cooking Maishan pork and that's low and slow. Because the fat is a much softer, finer grain, it melts at lower temperatures. It renders at lower temperatures. The lard is incredible for use in lardo. Other products in the kitchen, whipped lards. Um, my wife uses it in soaps with great success. But really, it's this micro-marbling, the ability of the pig to store fat within the muscle, which makes this an incredibly tender and delicious meat. If you're going to sell this meat in a meat model, it has to be as a premium pork. This marbling also makes it incredibly, an incredibly good product for smoked meats, cured meats, uh, what's typically known as charcuterie. Uh, this is a very hot trend in, in the foodie world. But you can see manageable levels of fat, great marbling, red meat. I wish I could let you taste it. It's got incredible flavor. We're over here now in the area of the farm we like to call Fraternity Row. Uh, we maintain 
currently six unique Maishan boars. Uh, to my knowledge, that's the largest unique boar herd in the United States. Um, this is Tang. We obtained him from the USDA. He's just three years old now. He's a full-grown Maishan boar. Um, the ability to manage this herd long term is based on the proper management of the genetics that are available. And it's quite a story about how we came to come by all these pigs. Uh, like I said, we used to, we were raising another breed of a hog and I acquired a, a boar and two sows from a farmer who had gotten his pigs from Iowa State and uh, we were enthralled with the breed. Originally we bought it to cross. We felt like it was too good a breed to cross with what we were raising. And I set off on a detective story. And for almost a year, anybody who was mildly associated with the original importation got an email from me and I heard nothing back. Uh, one day in a Facebook group, somebody mentioned that Ohio State had some Maishans and an argument broke out. And while they were arguing, I sent an email to Ohio State and one of the swine geneticists there said, no, we've never had them. We don't have them but I think I know someone who does. And it was from his kind gesture and his pointing me in the right direction that we got the University of Illinois sows. I drove all the way up to the University of Illinois and I brought Pink Lady and Panda home in the back of a 2003 Astro minivan uh, with the seats taken out and they were sleeping on the floor. Um, got a lot of strange looks at gas stations. But I still didn't have enough boars to have a genetically diverse herd. I went back to that same individual at Ohio State and he gave me the name of somebody at uh, USDA at the Meat Animal Research Center that he knew uh, was uh, working with the Maishans. So I sent him an email and I heard nothing back, but the US government is great. They have a phone directory for every department. So one day this poor swine geneticist gets a call from a crackpot in Tennessee saying, hey, I'm interested in Maishans, and I don't think he's used to getting calls from small farmers. But he was great, he was very patient, and he said, well, you know, the decision has come down. We're about to disperse the Maishan herd and discontinue the study. And I said, well, can, I said, well, how can I see if I can get some? And he said, well, I'll have to check with the facility director. So I waited three days, which is what I thought was about the polite amount of time to wait before really being annoying. I called back, and he hadn't found out, and I got the number of the facility director. And he said, well, you can have the boars, but we're slaughtering all the sows. And, I, and literally, my knees buckled. And if you can beg on the phone, that's what I was doing. And to his credit, uh, well, I talked about the discussion that we had. Uh, we were allowed to drive out to... Um, Clay, Nebraska, which is 1,600 miles one way from where I'm standing right now. I borrowed a trailer and used a truck that wasn't big enough to pull it. Came back through a tornado, but I came back with the last of the USDA herd of which Tang was one. Um, it's been a blessing. It's given this breed an opportunity to be properly managed because usually when you're saving a heritage breed, you come across somebody's farm that has the last of them. They've already all been inbred. And it's a matter of really documenting what you have uh, with the guinea hog association. There were like six founding boars, originally were entered as unrelated, and later DNA testing proved that a lot of them were related. I mean, it's a real struggle. But the unique history of the Maishan means we start out, when I got the pigs from USDA, I got a, a three generation pedigree. I know the coefficients of inbreeding on, on these pigs. I know these pigs are totally unrelated because of the 25-year isolation to the Illinois pigs. And they're both totally unrelated to the uh, Iowa State pigs because there's 25 years of separation. It's a tremendous opportunity to save these pigs. Um, and today, uh, I got deeply involved with the startup of the American Maishan Breeders Association because the Breeders Association was formed to benefit not just the breed, but the breeders. And it's formed not to tell people how to raise their pigs, but to provide an online pedigree database, which does exist today. And we'll go into that a little more later. 
But raising Mechons does have, there are some differences from raising other pigs. Um, Mechons are hyper prolific, so you've got to know, what am I going to do with all these babies? The other thing is, they mature sexually very early. A Mechon female or Mechon male is fully sexually mature at 12 weeks. That is not an exaggeration. You're talking about a 35, 40 pound female that can be impregnated. So initially you do have to split the piglets much earlier than you do with other pigs. The boars exist for one reason, and that's the breed. Um, they can't live with other boars. They can't live with the sows, or they'll pester them. If you put them with a castrated barrel, they'll try to breed the barrel. Here at the farm, and we'll show you a shot of it later on Fraternity Row, we've created seven unique boar lots. The boars can see each other through the fences, uh, but we don't put them together. If you put two Mechon boars together, they will not fight like other pigs. They won't bite each other, they won't gore each other, but they will attempt to breed each other constantly. They will wrestle for dominance, especially in hot weather. They will wear themselves out and they can get sick or die from the stress they create. They stop drinking, they stop eating. So if you've dealt with a pig that has low boar libido, this is a completely different pig. Um, I've had 12 and 13 week old Mechon boars impregnate full grown sows. So the separation of your boars from your sows is important. Now, once we get them separated, they're docile. They do tend to pace a little bit more. Uh, they'll talk to each other through the fence. We don't put the boars on a fence that uh, is adjoining a sow. The sow's going to heat every 21 days. The only time you hear a Mechon sow is when she's in heat. They have very active, very loud heats. They mount each other. It drives the boars crazy. So as you're planning, if you're planning to take on the Mechon breed, you need to plan on managing them separately. Now, one of the great things about them is because of their docile nature. Like I said, we have almost three miles of fencing here on the farm, and we have no electric. Uh, one of the things, and if we we'll pan over here, we use woven wire 47 inch field fence, properly installed, and by that I mean post spacing at about no more than uh, eight feet on level ground, tighter on any slope, paying special attention to get lots of attachments and connectors at the bottom because pigs defeat your fence at the bottom. Mechons are not climbing pigs like other breeds uh, like wild boar or osaba. So a properly installed field fence is all you need. Like I said, if, if we do have an occasion where we put the boars and the sows together, um, we will reinforce that with a hog panel because otherwise they stretch. That particular wire right there is class three wire. It has a uh, high tensile strand in it. Um, I don't care what kind of livestock you're, you're, you're raising. It's always better to spend another 20 or $30 a roll for your fencing because over time, goats, sheep, They'll take that cheap stuff and they'll stretch it out of shape and you'll constantly be fixing it up. Uh, so one of the things that you want to do is keep your boars separate. Uh, we're up here on another section of Fraternity Row uh, to show you how we have all our boars in a line in these boar pens. Uh, we have fencing on both sides of the road and then we'll set up chutes and run them across to breeding areas where, they, where they're the sows. I mean, Mechon pigs are incredibly docile, if you've seen today, but they're still pigs. If they think you want them to go somewhere, they're going to be resistant. So what we set up is little chutes, alleys, airlocks. Uh, we'll set up a little airlock on each gate area in the breeding areas. And we just let the pigs find their way in, close one door, open the other. We'll open up chutes across to the breeding areas. Um, Anytime you're dealing with a 350 pound animal, even if it's docile, you just have to plan ahead a little bit. I mean, you're gonna have to have an area where you can work them up into a trailer. You're gonna have to have a way to move them from 
their residence area to their breeding area. We don't like to bring the sows in with a boar and boars on either side having to watch them breed. So we have breeding areas set up across the driveway so they don't share a fence. This is just one little thing that we've done on our farm. Uh, you don't have to do it on your farm, but I know it's, it's great sometimes to go to other people's farms and see how they do things. Well, we've moved to another part of the farm. This is one of our farrowing areas. Uh, farrowing areas, a pink lady was in a farrowing area. She's bred and will have babies soon. Uh, of course, we visited Panda with her litter of babies, and we're in here. She'll probably be in frame soon with Zishi, who is one of our USDA sows. Uh, Zishi is due in the next two to three weeks. In total, we have four sows bred for our spring litters here in spring 2018. Um, from the beginning, um, the unique opportunity that we were presented here on the farm uh, led us to become deeply involved with the American Mason Breeders Association. The American Mason Breeders Association is the only registry for Mason pigs. Uh, currently, I am its president. Uh, the association is working very hard to document the pedigree history of the documented pure Mason pigs. All the pigs that came from USDA came with a three generation pedigree. I got a one generation pedigree on the Iowa pigs that I got. The two girls that we got from Illinois, uh, we know who the parents of those pigs were. And today, uh, there are pedigrees available for Mason's. Now, there are pigs out in the general population which, at least on their surface, appear to be pure, and some probably are. Um, I recounted the story of how we got the pigs from Illinois and USDA. Iowa State dispersed their herd between 2008 and 2010. Um, during that time, the pigs went to foreign countries as they dispersed them. A very small number of farmers got a hold of them, and some exotic animal breeders got a hold of them. So today, the undocumented pigs, the undocumented Mashons that are out there, probably come from one of two sources. The first source is that they are actually truly descendants of these pigs that were uh, dispersed. And there are indications that while some of them may be pure, some of them are highly, highly inbred. Uh, the um, research that I've done working with the AMBA on the National Herd Survey indicates that a very small number of breeder pairs produced a number of piglets that were sold in five or six different exotic animal auctions. And what happens is somebody buys a Mason an exotic animal auction in Missouri and then buys one an exotic animal auction in Tennessee or California and they think they have an unrelated pig and that's not true. As we've done the research, it really looks like I have traced pigs from the same breeding pair that occurred in Colorado, Wyoming, Illinois, Missouri, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. Inbreeding depression, that is the breeding of, of too closely, when you take breedings of pigs that are highly related and you begin to breed and rebreed them, you begin to lose traits in that pig, and that's an all swine. The typical traits of inbreeding depression are smaller litters, smaller size, um, less health, they're, they're less hardy, and a lot of the pigs, the undocumented pigs that I see are... Um, give indications that they're, that they're inbred. The other area that we're seeing pigs out there that, that are obviously Mashon influenced is that while the, the confinement industry did not like the Mashon sow as a production sow, they love Mashon cross boars as what they call heat check boars. They would buy semen from uh, semen suppliers and, and it would be Mashon semen. We would create these 50-50 Mashon boars then breed those boars back to their offspring so they get a 75% Mashon, 25% something else. And because of the sex drive of the male, coupled with the fact that they're so docile, they're used as what's known as heat check boars. Um, large confinement facilities use artificial insemination. And the trick in artificial insemination is to know 
when the sow is in heat. A lot of breeds have very quiet heats. Well, they send a Meshon boar in, he shows them who's in heat, they inseminate, they don't get attacked by the boar, and they move him back out. And there is some leakage of these high percentage boars. So when you're looking at an undocumented Meshon, there's nothing to say it's not a good pig. But what you don't know is the level of inbreeding, the level of purity, and the pedigree history. The American Meshon Breeders Association, and I, uh, that's located at meshonbreeders.com. Uh, I recommend you go there. You'll be able to find a certified breeder who breeds registered stock where you can tell your coefficient of inbreeding, and you'll know what you're breeding. Now, I, get, I hear this argument all the time. You can't eat paper. I don't need a piece of paper to tell me it's a good pig, and that's absolutely right. You don't use a pedigree to determine what's a good pig. Use your eyes. What the pedigree tells you is what are your chances of producing as good or better pig in the next breeding. So for, for those looking at this as a meat animal especially, actually in either a meat or a genetics model, the pedigree lets you retain the shoulders, the back line, the prolificacy, all those things that make it Meshon, because those things that make it Meshon disappear and can disappear forever through heavy inbreeding. Um, once again, if you've got an undocumented pig and you want to get bring in some documented Meshons, the greatest likelihood is that you have something with Iowa State genes probably a high likelihood that it's that it's inbred so if you're going to bring in another bloodline to improve your stock always look for a USDA or a USDA Illinois bloodline because you know you've got 25 years of genetic separation we're excited about having these pigs we're trying to be responsible breeders we encourage anyone looking at the line to breed them responsibly. Now, pedigreed stock is not inexpensive. Uh, you can probably expect to pay from a certified breeder with the American Meshon Breeders Association anywhere from $700 to $900 for breeding quality stock. And, but the thing is, you know what you have when you get it. You can breed it responsibly and you can be a positive contributor to the preservation of the genetics of this breed. Well, we're back with Pink Lady again here in the maternity ward. Um, she's finishing up the snack we gave her earlier. Uh, at this point, I'd like to address uh, our breeding program here at God's Blessing Farm. Um, we have a unique opportunity with the Meshon breed. Not only were they kept genetically isolated for over 25 years, they were also bred randomly, which I believe has had an impact on the breed in that the Chinese selectively bred them for 5,000 years. In order not to skew experiments, replacement stock was randomly picked from litters. Um, this means we kind of have a blank slate as breeders. And one of the things about the American Meshon Breeders Association that I support completely is that it's a rather libertarian group. Breed the pigs for the features that you want. Uh, here at the farm, uh, there are a lot of the things that Pink Lady has that we're really excited about. We like the long pendulous ears. We like the heavy face folds. But we also like this long back line. Um, faster growth rate. Achieving size at nine to ten months. These are all things that go in our evaluation program. We believe completely in that adage: um, breed the best, eat the rest. Uh, we we fired over 100 piglets last year on the farm, and less than 35 percent were sold as breeders. Uh, we try to maintain very high standards, but there are standards, and they may not be yours. I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Obviously, the Meshon breed is a tremendously unique breed. It may or may not be in your future. Um, we've tried to cover a lot. Obviously, we haven't covered everything. Uh, we invite you to visit us online. In a moment, you're going to have our web address, uh, which is www.godsblessingfarm.com.
You can find us on Facebook at uh, God's Blessing Farm Registered Maisons. And uh, if you're in the area, give us a call. Please give us advance notice. We're a working farm. If this is something you're seriously considering, we'd love to host you to see the pigs. Uh, it's a fantastic breed. And it's a fantastic breed that has, whose time has come again. Um, it would be a real shame to have these pigs disappear. Uh, we've got two of the younger sows over there if you want to pan over. Work in one of our woodlots. Those two girls were born in August. I've also done a series of videos for the American Maishon Breeders Association, which you can find on YouTube. Uh, they're a lot shorter. Uh, it's the American Maishon Breeders Association YouTube channel. Once again, feel free to uh, email us at the farm. Uh, visit the American Maishon Breeders Association website, which is maishonbreeders.com. Uh, send me an email. My email is rico at godsblessingfarm.com. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. We hope you have a blessed year. We hope if pigs are in your future that you'll consider the Maishon breed, that you look at your farm model and see if it fits. Take care, everyone. Have a great year.